Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Mailbag here on Collider Video, the all mailbag show where all we do is take your questions. I'm one of your hosts today. My name is John Campia, and I'm very pleased, tickled even, to be joined <laughs> by the Canadian jersey donning Josh McCuga. Just for you, John. Just for you. It's a Sidney Crosby jersey. It's a number 87 Sidney Crosby yes, jersey, who's uh, actually born in the same city as me. Boom. There you uh, go. We're both born in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah. It's not my hometown. Hometown is Hamilton. But, this I know. Yeah. But Sidney Crosby is yeah. a good Canadian my, kid. I'm my favorite uh, hockey player. Obviously, he plays for the Pittsburgh Penguins. But uh, the only sport that I don't root for the United States uh, in the Olympics is uh, men's hockey. And I, I root for Canada. So I'm not going to lie the... to you. It's probably about 30% of the reason why you got your job in here. <laughs> <laughs> just, just super talented and I'll everything. Give it to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Probably yep. give you the yep. leg up. All right, guys. Listen, as I said, this is the show where all we do is take your questions. As you know, we do a little bit of mailbag taking on Movie Talk Monday through Friday. But on the weekends here, we just like to dive into it and hear your voices. So with all of that out of the way, let's jump into it. The first question today comes to us from Marshall Weeks, who asks, where is Crank 3? <laughs> it's a, it, uh, I, uh, I would imagine uh, sitting somewhere in Jason Statham's <laughs> writing pile. Uh, he and uh, 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 Amy Smart are working on it, I believe. Uh, Crank 2. I, 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 when I used to host Guilty Movie Pleasures way back in the day, we did Crank and Crank 2. Those are some of the most absurd movies you'll oh, ever watch. but awesomely absurd. Yeah, I know. I mean, the second one, he would just have to have him electrocute himself, right? Uh, or was that, no, yeah, that was the second one. The first one was Adrenaline. The second one, yeah, because the second one was called High Voltage. Yes, High Voltage. He kept having to shock himself. Yeah. So I don't know what they do for three, but I remember... Because because it was one of the very first, I was doing the movie blog, and it was one of the very first celebrity interviews yeah. I got to was do. Was Statham? Was, no, it was actually Mark Neveldine and Brian Taylor, the okay. writers and directors sure. of Crank, right? So I talked to them. I eventually became friends with them. Uh, the two of them, plus Milo Ventimiglia from the new show, uh, This Is Us. Yeah, he's They're the three that. guys who introduced me to my wife. There you go. Uh, so I'm friends. But I remember, so I kind of became friends with them after Crank 1, right? Okay. And they invited me. Say, hey, we're shooting Crank 2 now. You want to come down and hang out? <laughs> I'm like, okay. So the first day I go to hang out with them, it was the strip club scene in oh, Crank 2. Oh, incredible. And they actually, I keep, and I've got pictures of this. They got me, hey, get up on the stage with Amy Smart. Yeah. And they got me to take my shirt off on the <laughs> on the pole. I put the little X tape on my nipples. I, I was dancing on a stripper the stage Canadian with Amy Statham Smart. The Canadian right over here. Yes. It was a, I'm not going to lie. It was a good day. But then <laughs> then they asked me if I want to come hang out for another day of shooting. And it was the this mansion thing. It was the big, crazy ending of oh, Crank 2. Yeah. And I had no idea what was in the script. I had no idea. Sure. And I got there and I'm like, is that a giant fish tank with the head of the villain from the last movie in it? They're like, yep. I'm like, how nuts is this movie going to be? It's on another <laughs> level. Because the first one, they have the sex on the horse track scene, which is just bonkers. Which was Awesome. I love Incredible. that. Incredible. Uh, if you've ever been to Santa Anita Racetrack, that's the most exciting thing you'll see on the track for sure. And this, and you this, know what? It wasn't at the Santa Anita Racetrack. Where was it? Hollywood Park. It was at Hollywood Park. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the now bad. defunct Hollywood. Now, yeah, Park. where yes. the new stadium will be. But uh, I, I, th those two movies, as absurd as they are, are so enjoyable in that that They're early two so thousands action sense of the word. They're so yeah. fun. And now, and this is Jason Statham. You're asking where's Crank Three? I'll, I'll tell you one guy who wants to get it made is Jason Statham. Oh, for sure. Because I remember I was sitting, I was in San Diego, having breakfast with one of the writer directors, Mark mm -hmm. Neveldine. And Jason Statham just kept texting him, crank, crank, <laughs> crank, like it's over and over and over. So where is it? Look, I can tell you, I can tell you this. Um, there is definitely a script somewhere. There, it, there, there's not a script. Okay, okay. But um, one of the two filmmakers is not sure they should go back and do Crank Three. <laughs> The studio wants to do Crank 3, Why and one we? of the two filmmakers does want to do it, okay. but, I, and I think the other filmmaker would do it, actually I know this, he would do it if they get the right idea, and okay. he doesn't feel like they got the right idea yet, but I'm telling you, they make Crank 3, I'm there, I'm, I, I'm so there, there in a heartbeat. Yes. All right, sorry, we took up a lot of time with that first question. I just love the Crank films. All right, we move on to the next question, which comes to us from Logan Wilson, who writes, do you think Power Rangers will make enough money this weekend to guarantee a sequel? Well, I I don't know about a guarantee, but if they don't do a sequel, I'd be kind of shocked. 
I think well, that yeah. I, I mean, just the buzz around it right now, and uh, the I, what do you think it makes in the box office this week? I mean, what is it trending towards? Sixty-five, you, you seventy? Know, honestly, I have not taken a look okay. at what it's tracking at, so I have no idea what it's tracking at at the moment. It's not really opening up against much. Well, what is it? It's opening up against. Well, it's opening up against life. Yeah, but um, for some and chips, <laughs> which I saw last night, by the way. And uh, are you in last, embargo? I mean, I mean Thursday night. No, no, I saw oh. it. In, I saw it in theater. I paid. Jeremy Johns and I bought tickets and walked into. We actually paid money to go see chips. It got destroyed by Variety, but I'm still excited because I feel like that movie's right in my wheelhouse. Okay, it's awful. <laughs> it's crap. It's awful. <laughs> I, I grinned or chuckled in the entire runtime of the movie maybe three times. Oh, no. One of them was a chuckle. Two of them were just grins <sighs> for the entire movie. But it's one of those things where we came Is it the writing out. or the acting? Um, It's definitely the writing. Okay. All right. So yeah. we came out, and look, Dax she Shepard should not be casting himself in the movies that sure. he writes and directs. Sure. Um, anyway, or his wife. <laughs> I mean, that just feels weird. He puts his own wife. Anyway, yeah. so we come out. And it's like one of those moments where it's like, this movie, okay, we got to look it up on Rotten Tomatoes because yeah. this has got to be 2 or 3%, 3%. And we looked up and it was like 37%. <sighs> it's I'm more like, than Iron how Fist. do one third of, yeah. of the people seeing this movie say this is good? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't get it. But, okay, so here's the thing. Back to the Power Rangers. Okay, sorry. Power Rangers has a production budget of $100 million. Now, Ooh. you're asking, what does it need to make this opening weekend to guarantee a sequel? Well, we already know they want to make a sequel. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Um, and color me shocked. I liked the movie. I, I thought it was going to be terrible. You know, it's funny because uh, yesterday, uh, on Friday, the the Power Rangers cast came into studio sure. here to do a movie trivia sure. showdown. Yeah. And I was just now. I we set this up before I saw Power Rangers, and I thought, well, that's okay. Power Rangers is going to suck, <laughs> and I'm just I'm just not going to be a part of what's going on. I'm just going to stay. Your I've, optimism is contagious. Well, I have done that before <laughs> yeah, where it's yeah. like, I know I've no movie, a movie has sucked and we've had like one of the stars come in the studio uh -huh. and I just stay in my office. I don't, <laughs> I don't bother going out and talking to them. Um, but anyway, so the power surprised me that I actually liked, I'm not going to lie to you and say I loved it. I didn't love it, but I liked it. And which is a huge shock to me. Made a hundred, made for a hundred million dollars figure about a $30 million uh, marketing, marketing budget. Yeah. So, you're talking about a movie now that needs to make in the neighborhood of probably about 300 million to maybe 310 worldwide. million dollars worldwide to break even and start making a profit. So what does it need to make opening weekend? To guarantee a sequel? 50 plus. 50. I'm going to say like 90. Really? I don't I don't think 50 guarantees a sequel. Okay. All right. 50 doesn't guarantee a sequel, but, but 90, I think if they make 90 million dollars opening weekend, you're going to hear an announcement the following week, Power Rangers to Greenlight. But you're you're also listen. The Asian market on this movie will be incredible because this is the and the international Australia, New Zealand. These there, uh, you know, the European markets. A lot of these Morphin Power Rangers or whatever they like morphed into. No pun intended. Uh, are very popular over there. Sure, and um, you know we had I, I, my friend Kimberly Crossman, who was all, she was the Pink Ranger when it was in New Zealand, Australia. That's just one little sect of it. So you got to imagine they have pockets of this fandom like a Cobster and a Perry that is everywhere. Okay, but I'm gonna I'm not gonna show you the numbers. Okay, okay, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the movie, the first mm -hmm. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie that came out in '95. Sure, take a guess on how much and try to come within 15 million. Okay. How much money did the movie make in foreign markets altogether? Is Not it, including the domestic, foreign markets. Is it 94, you said? 95. 95. 10 million. Made 28 million in okay. foreign 18 markets. 18 million. Okay. Off. okay. Uh, altogether, altogether, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers worldwide made $66 million. Okay. Mary Lemieux number. Um, now, two years later, Turbo, a Power Rangers movie, came okay. out, the second Power oh. Ranger movie. Any guess how much it made in the foreign markets? I'm going to go with my guess again. 10? 1.2. Uh, overall, worldwide, the Power <laughs> Rangers, the second Power Rangers movie made $9.6 million wow. worldwide okay. altogether. Not as well marketed so, as the first one. Uh, or it was and just nobody wanted to see sure, it. Sure, okay. I'm I'm just not so sure how strong the foreign market will be, but who knows? I mean, maybe you know, the, the box office report comes in tomorrow and it's like, 
Power Rangers, $125 million foreign market, $70 million domestic, and it almost $200 million on an opening weekend. We'll have to wait and see. As much as we made fun of those first images of them standing on Apple boxes. Which right? which, which they were terrible images. They those were not were terrible great. Images. Uh, but when that first trailer came out and the, subse- the sequential trailers came out, I thought, this looks pretty decent. Like, it had that... A Transformers feel to it. It looked like you know big. That's not giant, necessarily a good thing. <laughs> but in the in, but in the foreign markets, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, so, it really is. You know, uh, I, I would I would imagine if we were let, let's just do this over under eighty percent they make a sequel. Oh, I wish you were asking me this question after I saw the opening weekend yeah. box office number. I will say. For now, I'll say over. Yeah. But like, if this thing comes out and it makes thirty-five million dollars opening weekend, we're looking at. Then I'm going to ch- change that. Yeah. Change that a lot. Yeah, All right, yeah, yeah. let's move on. Next question comes to us from uh, Noot Lore, who writes: How do actors get paid for acting in movies, TV, etc.? Is it one big fat paycheck or spread out incrementally? Well, somebody who's acted in many movies. <laughs> no, uh, I have. Uh, although I've been in several films, yeah, I've been in a decent amount as an extra. I've been in several movies. I've been like I was in sure. Rain Wilson's The Rocker. Whoa! I was in uh, uh, Hayden Christensen's uh, uh, Shattered Glass. No, uh, where he's the teleporter. Oh, Jumper. Yeah, I was in Jumper. Okay. I was in a few scenes in Jumper. I was in The Incredible Hall. Sure. I was in a bunch of them. I was in Spider Man Three, really? Spider Man Two, uh, Enchanted, We Own the Night. Uh, yeah, you've been in a bunch. That, w- that was all when I was living in New York doing extra work, but I actually got a line in We Own the Night. My It was my first and only extra job. We Own the Night. It was this, again, my first extra job. I walk in, there's three naked women standing on the bar. I'm like, the extra work is this good every time. Tell me this story. And then uh, there's this big fight scene, and I'm wearing a uh, members-only jacket because We Own the Night took place in the 80s. Right. And so I'm wearing this We Own the Night jacket, and the guy, the director pulls me, Brad Gray, I think was the director, pulled me up and he was like, I love the jacket, you stand here. And the fight, sorry, the fight broke out and I was like, watch out. And he was like, hey, I like that kid. Put that line in there, watch out. (laughs) And then- (laughs) And a star was born. And a star was born. (laughs) So I got a SAG waiver, which is crazy. And then the movie comes out, my line is cut, I think because of probably residuals or whatever. (laughs) But I am featured prominently for like two whole seconds. In We Own the Night. Yep, Star is Born. <laughs> so, uh, you know, people like us, uh, we get paid a check for, sure. for doing the work we do. Yeah. Uh, however, it depends if you're union or non-union and all that kind of stuff. Traditionally speaking, if you're in a Hollywood movie and you're union and stuff like that, you get a salary for doing the film and then you get residuals. You mm-hmm. get that, that will pay on for however long the movie makes money. If you're on a TV show that gets syndication, you can live with a high life because you will earn a salary for as long as that show is in syndication. Yeah, it's, so yeah. everybody who is in Seinfeld... Dirt fine. Set for life. Yeah, that's why yeah. Jerry... Seinfeld just does comedians in cars getting coffee. Yeah. They're all fine. I mean, Julia Louis Dreyfus never had to do another episode of television, and yet she's won more Emmys than any of them on that show. Yeah. I mean, right now, like, Seinfeld is making more, he's making money faster than he can spend it, and he's not doing anything. Correct. Which is insane. Yeah. All right, let's move on. The next question comes from Fernando Fernandez, who writes I like that. I feel like Matthew Vaughn and Mel Gibson, if he is the Batman director, uh, talking about uh, Matthew, Matthew Vaughn, Vaughn being, yeah. yeah, would be a better fit if they switched movies. When I think back to Kingsman, I think Suicide Squad 2 being way better with Matthew Vaughn. What do you think? Thanks. Disagree. Uh, <laughs> okay. And I, I, am a, I am a Matthew Vaughn fanatic. And the idea of him, Matthew Vaughn, you know, doing anything is super exciting to me. But especially even if I hadn't seen Hacksaw Ridge which I I still think should have won the Oscar for best picture you and I are in agreement on that I I love that movie and seeing that type of stuff that Gibson can bring to this to the screen that type of complexity with with different points of view being treated equally and and not one over the it it Mm -hmm. was it's it was a triumph in filmmaking and then go back if you haven't seen I know most of you haven't seen Gibson's film Apocalypto which I have an amazing story on that movie. Tell me your story okay, about Apocalypto. So the first movie I saw when I moved to Los Angeles. Really? Okay, all my friends uh, got into, I forget what other movie was going on at the same time. I had met my friends. I didn't get my ticket in advance. This, the movie they were going to see sold out. I was by myself watching Apocalypto in the front row. Oh my first God. time at the Grove in LA. And I, I walked out shaken. That movie is disturbing, especially alone and especially in the front seat of a giant theater. It's, yeah. it's, and it's all directing. That whole movie oh, is just 100%. all about the directing. Mel Gibson bringing his sense of style and, and whatever to 
a Suicide Squad, I believe, is a match made in heaven. You're not wrong about looking at the Kingsman and thinking of the way that you know, a Suicide Squad 2 could be. But honestly, I think that's a little too comedic for Suicide Squad. Uh, look, I'm not, don't get me wrong. If they announced tomorrow that Matthew Vaughn was directing Suicide Squad 2, I'd be doing a little dance. Yes. I'd be super thrilled. But if you're going to ask me who should direct it, Matthew Vaughn or Mel, Mel. Gibson, I'm going to go Mel. I think Mel Gibson has shown, uh, especially with a, a giant ensemble cast like that, to do a movie that actually kind of gives justice to what the Suicide Squad is, is a violent group of killers rather than a group of heroes. Yeah. And I think that was the one thing they did wrong in the first Suicide Squad movie because, and I think a lot of people, people outside of the realm of where we are, we know a lot about the comics and, you know, even on Arrow when they had a little bit of the Suicide Squad thing kind of going is, people were like, why should we be rooting for a group of villains? And I said, well, you know, that's not really what the Suicide Squad is sort of, bait, like, is built around. At least the movie. Yeah. And I, if you go back to like the root of it in Suicide Squad 2 and really hit on not being a music video and having these long like Michael Jordan-esque and your Chicago Bulls, right? You you would get, and I think Mel Gibson would bring that, just that gritty nature yeah. to it that a, a movie like that does. Matthew Vaughn, I mean, obviously his first movie, Layer Cake, is one of my favorites. Uh, he should do a standalone Batman. I mean, he should do something where he has one character and he that that is the character that he's going through and it is a crime thriller. Um, yeah, and by, and by the way, it's 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 Superman. Superman, sorry, uh, that he would be doing, not Batman, because um, Matt Reeves would be doing uh, Batman. Would be doing Batman. Um, it will have to just wait and see. You know, I like the suit. I had fun with Suicide Squad. I enjoyed it for what it is a hot mess of a movie. It is. They made te plenty of mistakes, but I ended up enjoying it. But I do think the biggest mistake they made is this: is that they they put out these trailers with Amanda Waller. These are the worst of the worst. No, it's, they're not. Actually. You go out of your way to make them all actually deep down they're good people right. who have done bad things. They're good people who have done bad things. That's really what you make it out to be. But at their core, they're good and they have honor and they. It's like that. Come on, yeah. that's not the, a psycho woman with a bat is not really good to her core. No, especially so, when she walks away at the end. Yeah, I mean whatever. All yeah. right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Christopher Michael Woodburn is asking. Will there be any hope for the DCU if Wonder Woman and Justice League are divisive films? Look, if nothing had changed, I would say no, there would be no hope left. But what has happened in the last number of months? We've seen Warner Brothers, as I predicted they would. <laughs> uh, we've seen Warner Brothers, they've scrapped their plan. Mm -hmm. Like that plan they had like over a year ago, like a year and a half ago, that this is what the DCU is going to be. That's torn up and thrown out. They, they didn't even really want to move forward with Justice League as it was. They wanted to redo Justice League. They realized it was too late. We need to move forward with it as it is. All that kind of stuff. So I would say had they not completely changed directions and changed plan, I would say, yeah, then they'd be up Craps Creek. Right. But we know they have changed plans. And their new plan really doesn't kick in until after Justice League yeah. with their new plan. So even if Wonder Woman and Justice League are divisive, and I think Wonder Woman is not going to be divisive. I think it's going to be good, and I think it's going to be the first DCEU movie that gets over 75% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Justice League, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But even if, and I don't think they will be divisive. I think they're going to be good. But even if they're divisive, I think Warner Brothers is preparing for that and they've already course corrected. We're just not going to see the results of their course correction until after Justice League. So I would say we can't judge that until well after Justice League. Let me just say this too. Okay, I know that there's been like these early reports of Wonder Woman not being that great and we're, we're going to see a, a Justice League full trailer very soon or at least... Well, today. Technically today. Yes, yeah. right. So... Here's the thing. I think that the Wonder Woman trailers look amazing. That newest one almost gave away a lot of the movie, which kind of disappointed me. I kind of wish I hadn't watched it because it shows a lot of her training. And, I, you know, some. regardless, I think that movie is going to be fantastic. The fact that after Justice League, they're kind of like retooling, it gets me a little disappointed because if those two movies do really well, then maybe the retooling doesn't need to happen as much. It's like a golfer going into the back nine saying, like, didn't have a fr great front nine. Forget about it. I'm going to the back nine. But, that, but still your 18 holes count overall. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know. That, that that worries me a little bit in the sense of, well, if Justice League sucks, don't worry about it. We're going to do it. That's not the attitude you should have. Correct? Oh, no. Absolutely. It's not the attitude they should have. But they were already so invested in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we heard recently they went back for reshoots, which every big movie plans, of whatever. Course. But they actually did some changes to the movie in the reshoots. We, okay. It sounds like they're adding Green Lantern now because of the future changes and plans they had. Right. 
Look, I, I'm not saying they're guaranteed to succeed, not at all. I just think if either of these two films are divisive, I don't think it necessarily means all is lost because Warner Brothers has already started to address whatever problems they have. We're just not going to see the results of their course correction until later. Right. You're all right. right. Let's move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from Remington Keys, who writes, is it normal for an actress to ask to be paid to be interviewed for a movie? Um, well, here's the thing. If you go on late night TV, you get money. Yeah, you get an appearance fee. You get an appearance fee. Uh, and, and most television shows, you will get an appearance fee, even though you're promoting a product. Um, you know, doing... I, I've done the Josh McCuga show in Between the Sheets for a long time. There are a lot of YouTubers out there that ask to be paid to right, come on the show. For appearance feeds, yeah. For appearance fees, and that makes total sense. I think... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense. You're taking time out of your day, even though you're promoting a movie, to ask to be paid, just you're doing work. So it all depends on um, the situation. So here's the thing. I've had a lot of like bloggers, going back to the movie blog days, I've had a lot of bloggers and YouTubers and things like that ask me about that saying, you know, they, they actually took the initiative to reach out, find out who so-and-so's representation are, and sure. reach out, and to be told that, um, well, you, there would be an appearance fee, yeah. and the bloggers. Now, I've we have never either with AMC or with Collider, we've never paid an appearance fee to anybody. So, what I've had those bloggers and YouTubers say to me is, "How dare they? Why don't you just come and get the free publicity?" Well, because of this. Remember, everybody wants those talent those talents to be on For their sure. podcasts, YouTube channels, blogs. They all want them. So the question is that the talent and their reps are going to be asking is, what does coming on your YouTube channel for say, what is that actually going to do for us? Right. If, you're too, if your YouTube channel, say, has less than like 20,000 subscribers, what's the point? Like a, a, a rep will be thinking, this is what a, a PR agent will be thinking for their client. Me bringing my client, taking time out of my client's thing to go to that channel we're not going to get any exposure right. on that channel. We would be better served to use our time to go to a different television network, YouTube channel, uh, right. podcasting network that's ha got much more viewers and we'll get much more bang for our buck if we do it that way. And that's sort of why junkets exist is that you get you, the studio pays for you to go to the Ritz or the Four Seasons or a very high end hotel. They bring in all the press. Everybody gets four minutes and you get your soundbite for your website, your channel, whatever. If you want to do an extended interview, a lot there. I mean, listen, we live in this world. A lot of people say no, like 99% of people say no, because these actors, producers, writers, directors, their schedule is so incredibly busy that getting here to do more than four minutes and making time out of their day. I mean, it's a full hour and a half commitment to really come over, do the interview, leave, go back to your day. So getting that done is really, really tough. It doesn't matter how big the YouTube channel is or how big the show is. It's really hard to schedule. And that's yeah. why junkets exist. And it's not. And so then what will happen is sometimes, you know, the agent will look at the situation. So you give a, 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 a an interview request and you've got like 500 subscribers on your yeah. podcast, or whatever. So then the agent is going to say, oh, so you're the one who's going to be benefiting from this, not our, my client. Right. So, okay, if you really want to do the, to, to do the interview, then here's what an appearance fee would be. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, it's very rare, but sometimes it will happen with smaller networks trying to get things. But uh, I do find that sometimes smaller podcasts, YouTube channels, whatever, and I found this too, like with my peers when I was developing the movie blog, yeah. there's a sense of, well, everybody should come and talk to me because they're getting free publicity. It's like, no, they can get free publicity anywhere and on a much bigger scale. There has to be a reason why they would want to come and talk to you. They get free publicity just walking out of Koi and TMZ snapping a picture. Yep, pretty right. much. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes from Mark Kodzetsky, who writes, uh, Kodzeki, sorry. Which do you think is better, Marvel Phase 1 or Phase 2? Well, phase one had um, the first Iron Man, yeah. which was great. The first Thor, which I Loved. adore the first yeah. Thor, the one directed by Kenneth Branagh. That one was amazing. However, I, you know, and the first Captain America, I thought was really solid too. Sure. But, I, you know, Captain America Winter Soldier uh, was in the next one. Um, Civil War, which is to date my favorite outside of... Yeah, I mean, listen, I know that I'm in a very, very small minority. I loved Ant-Man. Ant-Man might be my favorite standalone Marvel Cinematic Universe film. Uh, but 
Civil War, I think, is the is the well, standard. Well, Civil bearer. War would be considered Phase Three, wouldn't it? Because it came after Avengers Ultron. Okay, yeah. So Phase Three. All right. So my bad I'm still gonna go. One. I'm gonna go Phase Two. I think Phase Two was the better one. Phase One had the Incredible Hulk. It did, which I actually really liked. I know a lot of people uh, don't. I also really okay. quite liked it. Um, With Abomination, a character they should bring back, by the way. Sure. Yeah, I I don't know. I may lean tr- towards Phase One simply because of Incredible Hulk and Iron Man One. All right, let's move on to the next question. That comes to us from Oscar Herrera, who writes, Since Jessica Henwick is already under the Disney umbrella and is a standout in Iron Fist, do you think she is the front runner for a live action Mulan? Or would you like to see, or who would you like to see portray Mulan? Well, first of all, Iron Fist is only as good as Jessica Henwick took it in that series. I think you yes. and she was the standout star of that show, 100%. And Madam Gao. And Madam Gao. Yeah, I was just going to say Madam Gao. And the the guy, I, I want to know, his, I forget his name, but the guy that played the Drunken Master, he was up for Iron Fist. And they gave him the Drunken Master role as like a consolation prize. But he was in the top three for Iron Fist, for that role, oh, for really? Danny Rand. Yeah. But for me, Colleen Wing drives that entire series. Colleen Wing is the best. And if yeah. she wanted to do Mulan, I'd be all for that. She's incredible. And and don't actors can go and act in whatever the movie they yeah. movies they want. I mean, so don't don't worry about it because, you know, uh Chris Evans is a great example of that. He was under the Fox umbrella yeah. and he was Johnny Storm for a couple of movies. Sure. But then that was no problem to switch over to Marvel and be Captain America. Yeah. And the world has been better for it. So um which look I'll say the same thing I say about everything. Do you think this actor or actress should play this role? She's a very talented, great actress. She would be a great Mulan. And so would any one of a hundred other great, talented actresses. Mm-hmm. That's usually... But no, if they announced her tomorrow as being Mulan... On board. I, I'd be on board. Totally yeah. on board. All right, here we go. Uh, Ryan Henry writes, Do you think we'll get to see Pepper Potts use her powers in Avengers or Iron Man 4? You ain't seen Pepper Potts again. Yeah, she's out. She's out. They're, yeah, they're... Uh, it's done. Yeah. She doesn't want to be part of the MCU. And I don't think the MCU wants her. Correct. So uh, we're not going to see Pepper Potts Go buy again. some goop. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next question comes from John Hoskins, who writes, what are the odds that we see Harrison Ford in flashbacks in episode eight? Yeah. Zero. Double zero. I don't think yeah. uh, he's going to do it at all. I don't. I don't think... I'm not a huge fan of flashbacks in Star Wars films, right? And, and I don't, I don't see the the ne- the necessity for it. We're getting a standalone Han Solo movie. I don't, I don't understand why we need a flashback of Han Solo in Episode Eight. Are yeah, no, I, 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 I know, I, I just don't see the point of it. I don't see the purpose of it. I don't know what would be accomplished by it. Agreed. It would just be putting him up there for the sake of putting him up there. It's on. And and the moment you start making your films on that basis, let's just put this in for the sake of put, putting this in, you're starting to go down a bad path, Absolutely. a bad and dangerous path, and yes. I don't think it's something they should be doing. 100%. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from uh, Mudabir Ahmed, who writes, what happened to Rosamund Pike's career after Gone Girl in 2014. She's done one small indie film, uh, A United Kingdom. But after playing the amazing Amy in Gone Girl, she should have been a superstar in Hollywood. 2.5 years and only one small film? Well, that's a really good question. I I think she was absolutely fantastic in that. She's gorgeous. She's been great in other things, too. Um you know, look, it says on her IMDb, she's in pre-production for The Benz. She's in completed The Man with the Iron Heart. Uh, she's filming Entebbe, High Wire Acts in post-production, and Hostels in post-production. So she's got movies coming out. Now, I don't know anything in her personal life. Maybe, did she have a baby? I don't even know. That's that's usually the first place my mind goes right. when, when an actress just disappears. Either they just recently got married, or they just recently started a family, or they just wanted a break, or whatever. I right. thought she was really good in that... Um, um, Edgar Wright film, um, uh, the one they just did, uh, World's End. Yeah. Uh, I thought yeah. she was really good in World's End, but you know, she was, I mean, what she did in Gone Girl was crazy good. I, I would have loved to have seen her in a lot more stuff. If you were single watching Gone Girl, you stay single. You don't, <laughs> don't get into a relationship. If you're married, you start watching your wife very carefully. <laughs> All right. Rafael A. Castillo writes, do you still think the Batman movie will be made or is it dead? 
oh, there's no way in hell it doesn't get made. It ha- it, yeah, it's absolutely getting made. Now, who will be directing it? I mean, right now it's it's Matt Reeves. Right. Uh, I I still th- I think Matt Reeves is a done deal. I think Do you he's- think that Ben Affleck will be Batman at the end of the day? I um okay, look, I said this before. I've been saying okay. this the whole time. I will I will repeat it. I know Ben Affleck wants out of being Batman. Yeah. Um, but as I said the very first time I brought this up, uh, there are contractual obligations and there are a lot of things going on. If if he does do the first Batman movie, the first Stan Batman mm-hmm. movie, that will be the final time we see him as Batman. Yeah, I, I guarantee think. it. That'll be the final time we see him as Batman. And whether or not they're going to go ahead and and have him be Batman in the first Batman film or or if one of the changes they're going to make in Justice League is that the Ben Affleck Batman dies and then all of a sudden a um, an army, army Hammer, Dick Grayson, Nightwing yes. becomes the new Batman sure. or whatever. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I simply don't know. Um, but either way, Batman is the crown jewel character. They're going to do it. Now, obviously, I think it would be best if Ben Affleck was Batman. Mm -hmm. I think he's the best Batman we've had on film. And I like continuity's sake, too. Yeah, I mean, for the sake of continuity. And look, I'm not saying that Batman vs. I'm clearly not saying that Batman vs. Superman was the best Batman movie ever. Obviously, that that title belongs to The Dark Knight. Sure. Or the 1989 Michael Keaton, but that's just me. Or, yeah, or or many (laughs) others. Maybe maybe Batman and Robin, if you're into nipples. (laughs) But I do think, though... (laughs) That that Ben Affleck, uh, I, I've said this before, I will say it again, I will say it till the end of time, until somebody else better comes along. Ben Affleck, I think, gave us the best on-screen portrayal of Batman that we've ever had. I, I just think he was the perfect guy for it. I also thought he was the perfect guy to direct it. Um, and unfortunately, that's not going to yeah. happen for, for whatever reasons. Uh, and so I th- find that all unfortunate. But will Ben Affleck be Batman in the next Batman movie? I think it's 50-50. I honestly, I don't know. Do you think, uh, and we brought this up in our this, the press conference sketch, which you guys haven't seen, check it out here on the channel. Do you think that because Live By Night did poorly, he was in such a headspace that it kind of like weakened his stance in the Batman movie, in directing or writing? I, I, I think all, any problems that exist, I mean, any problem, professional, uh, behind the scenes, contextual, all, all types of, the, the good and the bad. All, sure. I think all the problems um, that were there and circumstances that were setting up were all in place before Live By Night ever premiered. Okay, all right. So, did Live By Night, Help. Um, the, the let, let's not call it failure, but let's call it lack of big success. Did sure. the lack of big success for Live By Night exasperate the problems? Yeah. Probably. I mean, that's probably fair to say. Sure. I mean, would be for any of us. Uh, I'm not really sure, but you, I don't think it was a big game changer. You said it's your favorite Batman portrayal on screen, which I don't disagree with. I will say that Ben Affleck in real life is sort of Batman. And I will say this because I was at Sundance. It was a long time ago. It's when Company Men debuted <laughs> at, at Sundance. A limo pulls up in the main street. Ben Affleck gets out of the limo. He's got a jacket on. He like flashes the jacket. You know, like whew, he looks at the crowd and goes, and walks right into a bar, and, and my buddy turns and goes, he's Batman. <laughs> I was like, I know, look at him, he's perfect, he's perfect. I remember the first time I met Ben Affleck, I was sit- I sat down with him to talk about uh, Argo. Okay. And I had, I had just seen Argo, and I sat down with him, and I said, dude, like before anything else, just let me tell you, and this was before the Oscars and everything, I'm like, dude, if you don't get nominated for best director for this, I'm gonna slash somebody's tires. <laughs> I, liter- I literally said, I'm gonna slash somebody's tires. He just leans up. I'm in. <laughs> it, See, he's Batman. He's, he's Batman. He's he's all types of yes. awesome. Yes. I mean, he's Incredible. all types of awesome. Yep. All right, let's move on here. Uh, Ivali uh, Shakar writes, any updates on the new James Bond movie? Do you think Craig will return? If not, who is your, your pick? Uh, I Look, the last news I heard, the producer saying, Look, Daniel Craig is our Bond. He's our first guy. Mm-hmm. There's all that talk about Daniel Craig doesn't want to be Bond anymore. But then he came out recently and said, no, I love being James Bond. I'll be James Bond. Yeah. Like, if you ask me as soon as we're done shooting a movie, do I want to, especially one that's physically challenging, the one that keeps me away from my family for five or six months at a time, yeah. I'm going to say, I cannot, I, I'd rather shove needles under my f- fingernails. But he said, of course I want to be, be James Bond. So what we know is we've got the producer saying, Daniel Craig's our, our bond. We want Daniel Craig. And Daniel Craig now saying, yeah, I want to keep being thing. And I believe he still has another uh, another film under his deal. Under his deal. If he wants to do it and if they want, still want to do it. I I haven't heard any uh, anything about any movement on new James Bond. But if I had to put money on it, 
there's going to be another James Bond, and it's going to be Daniel Craig, at least in the next one. This is one of the funnier things you'll see on IMDb. It says, Bond 25 announced. And then under it, it says, James Bond rumored. So mm. it's like, yeah, everybody's sort of saying it's Daniel Craig. If not, you know, I don't. I personally don't love the idea of Tom Hiddleston, but I could see... I would look, it's, again, it's another one of those situations. There's a lot of guys that I would totally yeah. buy into. Um, Henry Cavill was the next in line to be James Bond. And he looks like a Bond. It was down between Daniel Craig and Henry Cavill. Yeah. And because uh, Henry Cavill was a very well in in the Hollywood casting circles, yeah. even though film fans didn't know his name and didn't know who he was, Henry Cavill was considered, a hot, in sports terminology, a hot, can't miss prospect. Sure. And because he was almost Superman before he yep. was Superman, he was almost James Bond. So if they announced Henry Cavill as Bond, I'd be all on board. If they announced Tom Hiddleston, he's a great actor, I'll be on board. If they announced Idris Elba, great actor, I'll be all on board. I don't, I mean, I, there's a lot of good guys. As long as they pick a good one, sure, I'll be totally happy. But I think and it's going to be in his thing. Craig. Listen, he's he's in three different projects right now, uh, Daniel Craig is. So he's not not busy. You know what he's not in? What's that? The new Gone Girl movie. Yeah. <laughs> which pisses me off because I love, love that incarnation of Gone Girl. Agreed. All right, let's take to two more questions here really quick. Uh, this one comes from Brijahat Sapal, who writes, would Beauty and the Beast have made $200 million opening weekend if it was 90% or higher on Rotten Tomatoes? Hmm. Would it have made more? 100% guarantee it would have made more. Would it have made 200? Like, would it have made another 25 million? Here's where here's where you're losing. Here's what you're losing on Beauty and the Beats and why I don't think it made 200 million. Did you say and why Beauty and the Beats? Did I say Beauty and the Beat? <laughs> Disney uh, and just, Dr. Dre yeah. bring you Beauty and the Beats. That's a it's totally Dan, different movie. Dan Stevens with beats on his head. Shit, I just gave some stupid studio exec an idea. <laughs> Beauty and the Beats. Beauty and the Beats, uh, which is also a Justin Bieber song, Beauty and the Beat. Oh, also, I remember. That's right. That is yeah. one of his lyrics. Uh, so here's the thing. I think what you're missing, what you got in Jurassic World and what you get in uh, 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 Marvel, uh, Captain America Civil War, right? Uh, and what you got, well, no, that didn't make $200 million first weekend. But what you got in Star Wars, right, Episode Seven, is that you get a ton more guys going to the theater. A lot yeah. of the guys that went to see Beauty and the Beast were on dates. I wouldn't have gone to see it if I wasn't in a relationship. And I wouldn't have definitely not gone to see it opening weekend. But you had a lot of parents taking their kids, so there's tickets, and you had a lot of guys going on dates with girls. Those other single guys, they went to see something else. By the way, uh, any on-camera personalities, if you want to know if they're seeing multiple women at once, they'll always say, if I wasn't in a relationship. <laughs> Notice they didn't specify anything. That way they, they don't get in any trouble. I'm just, yes. just throwing that out there. <laughs> I'm not trying to cause any problems Thanks, John. at home. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm right. engaged. <laughs> um, again, he didn't specify a name. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay. Last question comes to us from Ben Holmes, who writes, "Hey guys, do you think Disney will ever attempt to adapt some of the Pixar films into live action?" Here's here's the problem with that. That's that's nearly impossible. How do you do Toy Story live yeah. action? Yeah. Well, I mean, because really. I mean, you could do CG animation, but it's already in CG animation. Sure. And you don't, there's not really any human, there's, there's a few minutes of human characters. It's almost characters. like Charlie Brown's parents. Like the humans are really cut out of that yeah. movie. That's the point of it. I mean, you see a lot of feet mm -hmm. and you see the back of heads and then you see faces sometimes. But really, it's a focus. On, do you do, I mean, I guess Wally? Well, I mean, that would be a big sci fi sure. epic if you did that. Ratatouille? Oh. Up would be tough. Yeah, up's really hard. I, I don't see why you would. Yeah, and I think those movies are so well done. And I mean, obviously I said that about Beauty and the Beast and and, and uh, Little Mermaid, but they're going ahead. And, and I got to tell you, I watched Beauty and the Beast. I'm not a big, huge fan of musicals. A lot of people know that, but I, I enjoyed that movie. I really did. I, I, I had a yeah, really good time with yeah, it. Agreed. Was it as good as the animated one? No, of course not. No, but it was still a great movie. Judge yeah. a movie on its own merits. Listen, if you want to get a girl and you look like the Beast, just get a mansion with a library. You'll be fine. <laughs> and you'll be totally fine. That's what that's what my, my friend said walking out of it. He goes, so the moral of the Beauty of the Beast is 
Doesn't matter what you are. If you're a dude with lots of money, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> You'll get the hottest girl in the village. <laughs> Little town. Okay. That'll do it for us, guys, for this installment of Mailbag. We'll be back again tomorrow. Thanks a lot for being here. Remember, if you want to get a topic on Mailbag, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Maybe you'll see your question here on Mailbag. Maybe you'll see it on Monday through Friday on Movie Talk. Maybe you won't see it at all because we get thousands of questions every week. <laughs> but go ahead and send it on in anyway. Josh McCoog, where can people find you online? At Josh McCoog on Twitter and Instagram. Collider TV Talk every Monday. And you guys can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter. Simply add John Campion. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, bye-bye.